York City. Josh Brown, Kerry Firestone, and Steve Weiss are here with me watching the markets bounce back uh, a little bit after the worst day, Josh, in, in nearly a month. So you got rates are rising, anxieties are too. Yeah. As we're talking about rate cuts and maybe not as many as we thought, Bostic weighing in again. One cut this year he sees and maybe in the fourth quarter. You know, it's really interesting because uh, when I take the market's temperature, one of the things that I really want to look at is just to get a sense of where RSIs are, where is the relative strength, what's overheating, and what is gaining momentum. When you look at the S&P 500, 7% of the S&P 500 components have advanced three days in a row. That's almost nothing. Like, the market is almost completely stalled out here. That's below the average reading, which is 12%. But keep in mind, as late as mid-March, that was at 45%. So we've had a huge move in the amount of stocks that are making highs, that are advancing, that are, that are trading higher. Um, the Russell is a different story, Judge. When you think about the Russell 2000 right now, you've got the average RSI at 52. That is a high that we haven't seen since February of 2023. So that rotation that a lot of people have been talking about, saying it's coming, it did come, and if you threw some names in your portfolio that are outside the S&P 500, you're, you're not seeing that stall. You're just seeing an advance in a different area than what we've become accustomed to. All right, I just is, wanna, that, is that what it's all about? It feels like it is. Yeah, it, it, it's so interesting because you have these, these two opposite forces. One's hoping, for, as Carrie was alluding to, for the economic data to be weak, and the other's, you know, so you can get rates coming down. But the way I look at it, Here's the battle. The battle is, will the strength of the economy continue to make a rate cut a non-event, essentially, right? So if the economy continues this strong, what's the difference if the Fed doesn't cut this year or cuts once this year? So that's really the debate. But here's the difference, as I see it. The longer rates stay higher, the more damage it will ultimately do to the consumer and to certain businesses. So I think that's sort of like short term. But that really is a debate going on, saying you hear it all the time, except for a blip that we have like yesterday when you see yields, rates really rocket up. I mean, what we've seen, the backup in rates has been astounding in the face of a market that continues to go up. The best idea that you could hear is economy remains strong and the Fed still cuts. Exactly. That's the Goldilocks scenario that some are, are hoping comes to fruition right. for, in some reasons, what you said, that the Fed wants to almost preemptively make a move so that they don't cause unnecessary issues it's, to an economy that right. they've managed to actually pull off pretty well. But here's the very, very complicating factor, which is that as you see commodities rise, you know, not just oil, commodities across the board, uh, and you see wage growth. You know, today in the report, you're, the, you know, new employers are paying 10 percent hikes to employers to bring them in. Then what does the Fed do? Is the Fed focused on inflation? And that's their primary focus and care less about what they're doing to the economy. What do you think, what do you think happens? Though? All right. So, so we're going to get the, the yep. March uh, non-farm payrolls on Friday. Yep. Uh, if let's say it's uh, 216,000 jobs added is consensus. February, we added 275. So we're clearly calming down in yep. the labor market, but still strong. If that number were to disappoint to the downside, is that bullish stocks or bearish stocks? That's what wage growth is. Okay. I, I think, so think that, that's I more think important that's, than headline. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Say more. Yeah, because it's, uh, it's inflationary. So if, you know, if, you're paying, if you're paying employer employees more, you've got historically low uh, employment, right? Unemployment now. So it doesn't matter if it's 150 or if it's 250. It matters in, you know, sort of like for that moment at that point in time. But then you just have to look at wage growth. Carrie, it's um, HSBC today who was saying it's the more important question now is if, not when, the Fed cuts rates. And I want you to listen to what Steve Cohen, obviously the .72 chairman and CEO, the Met New York Mets owner, said about his own expectations for rate cuts during his interview this morning on Squawk Box with Andrew Ross Sorkin. I think the market expects three cuts. I think that's the number. I don't. I don't. I don't disagree with that. I, I, you know, I think inflation's been, you know, somewhat contained. And I think, I mean, ultimately, what it'll come down to is that a true statement or not. Uh, it, you know, we think the Fed thinks they, you know, eventually is going to come down to two percent. Right. Inflation rate. What do you think? I think that's going to be hard. Let's listen to what Tony Pascarello told me yesterday too on closing bell from Goldman Sachs. I mean, he's still 
bullish on the market. The Fed plays a role in that, of course. Listen to what he told me. I'm still a believer in the bull thesis. I think the economy remains strong. We're forecasting the better part of 3% GDP growth this year. Okay. That might be part of like the local complexity, by the way. A believer that the Fed put is alive and well, should they choose to exercise it. And then in the background, which doesn't matter in daily today, you've got the AI story and you've got the GLP one story, which we think have a lot of room. Okay, so in other words, Josh, cut the noise out. Yeah. Right. The trends are still your friend. They're both intact, be it AI, GLP-1. The Fed is still going to cut. They may not be on your schedule. They may not be on the market schedule originally, but it's going to happen. And that's really all that matters at the end of the day. Yeah. And I also think we're in uh, the first week of April. We're already looking at an above average annual return. If we were to get nothing from here, it's still a pretty good year. But I think we're getting more because the earnings story in the second half we might have to see estimates come down. They have been coming down since January. This is how it works every year, that seasonality. But once those estimates are done coming down and we start the beat and raise game again, which we're very good at playing, where we celebrate a company for putting out guidance, then they slightly beat, we celebrate some more, guidance comes down, then they beat that too. So that's the game that you're gonna see in the second half of this year. And markets tend to react favorably even though everyone is in on the joke. You have that as one leg of the stool. The second leg of the stool, even if you get one rate cut, the fact that a rate cut cycle is starting, good enough. The third leg of the stool, and I would argue this is probably the most important, you're seeing this labor market cool off to the point where employers can breathe, but you're not seeing it cool off so much so that this unbelievable consumer spending story has to go away. This could be with us for the end of the year. So those are the three biggest things to me. Yeah, the rate cut cycle starting. Yep. That sort of trumps everything else in the minds of many quickly to you. Yeah, and, and I'd say if you listen to the rest of Steve's interview, and I used to work for Steve, and he's one of the best, clearly. AI. I'm going to get to that, yeah. too, and I'm going to play, I'm going to play some sound uh, regarding what Steve Cohen had to say about AI and productivity. But let me get right to Steve Leisman now, because we do have those breaking headlines from Fed Chair Powell. He is speaking at Stanford University, and what is he saying, Steve? He says if the economy evolves as expected, it will be appropriate to lower rates at some point this year. But the Fed chair speaking at the Stanford Graduate School of Business says it will not be appropriate to lower the policy rate without greater confidence. Inflation is coming down. He cites the Fed policy statement in making that comment. He said the Fed has time to let incoming data guide its decisions. And the policy rate, though, is likely at its peak. That's the good news. Inflation, he says, has come down significantly, but it is still running above the Fed's 2% target. The job of sustainably returning it to target, quote, is not yet Weiss, done. I'll send it back to you. I didn't mean to cut you off earlier. Um, so, you know, Powell's not really telling us anything we don't know, I don't think. No, I, and I think that's typically the case between meetings that he keeps the, uh, the party line going. And, but you're right. It seems like that, that, that the FOMC is coalescing around. You know, we're still ready to... To ease, we just need to see some some more traction on, on lowering inflation and the economy remains strong. But if, if you want to go to what the rest of Steve's conversation... Well, you know, why don't I play that? Because, okay. you know, he, he was asked sort of... And you always want to get someone like Steve Cohen's view on the sort of yeah. general market, given everything that's gone on with AI and these other trends. Let's listen to what he said about the market at large, whether we're in a bubble or not. I don't see it as a bubble. I mean, I think the markets are discounting some of what uh, we, you know, they think AI is going to do for companies. You think it's discounting? Discounting. So I, you think that yeah. there's even more upside I as do. a result of AI? I, you know, my view is this is a really durable theme. All right, so Weiss, he said we're not in 99, right, right because AI is durable, and he used those, that's his word. He talked about more productivity, more efficiency for businesses of all sizes, not just a firm like his, but firms and small businesses, large businesses, media, you're going to see productivity go up, efficiency, and, and all of that, and that's going to lead the market higher. Yeah, and, and look, let me just give some context on Steve. So Steve, I'd stand by his desk. He would short the market at the top during the day, buy, cover and buy it back and go long, you know, at the bottom and then do it all over again. And as the world's changed, meaning the game has changed, he's changed. So he's become longer term somewhat. 
uh, and not so much short-term trading, so tough. So you got to pay attention. He's got the best information. He's got a thousand people working for him, of which a large number of traders. He gets the best information from purely bottoms-up fundamental work. So when he talks about it, he's talking about that thousand-person company that he has that is so technologically advanced, and he's saying we could see it do more. Well, because he well he used a, an anecdote from his own right, company exactly to, to make the statement that he did, but the broader theme of no bubble because this is durable yeah. and you're going to get productivity and uh, efficiency increases and that's going to mean a lot and some of which isn't even in the market yet. Look, you could say that there are stocks that are in the AI theme that have been behaving in bubbly ways. I don't think that anyone reasonable would disagree, um, but you can't really say that about the biggest AI company, NVIDIA, because how do you have a bubble with a stock trading 24 times forward earnings? It's pretty tough to make the case. The other characteristic well, you just not look at, Sorry, real quick. You, they, they look at the price action on the stock more so than the, the valuation. They're like, oh my God, the stock's up 81% year to date. And they're saying, just based on price escalation alone, this is kind of crazy. I feel you, but look at the earnings estimates. No, okay, not in a vacuum is my point. Uh, but the other point I would make is you need capital markets to dance. You're playing the music, you want to call it a bubble, you can't have 36 IPOs year to date. It's just, that, it's just not what it is. So, and I'll give you something else. Over the last month, we took a look at what factors have been driving market performance. You'd be amazed to hear AI has nothing to do with it. The yield factor has outperformed everything. The highest yielding stocks are up 3% over the last month. Uh, growth was the worst factor, flat on the month. Value was number two, low vol was number three. So that's a bubble? How? It's not. We're seeing broad-based rallies. 90% of the S&P advancing over the last month. This is a very different environment than bubbles past. Could we have one? We have a bubble? Sure, of course, it's possible. But let's not worry about things before they actually take place. Do we, do we take what Mr. Cohen has said and what Pascarello says? It's almost like, keep your, Tony's point broader is keep your eye on the ball. Stay with what's working, these large stocks, maybe even your, you know, like Adam Parker would say, be overweight, an already large part of the market. Is, is that the best strategy? I think so. Even with broadening in the last month? Well, it obviously depends what you're long and what's been working for how long. But if you're talking about mega cap tech and the AI related names, you really are just the beginning. You don't see these kinds of, of transformations just take a week or two or a year or two years. This is a forever thing. You haven't even fleshed out all the business use cases for, uh, for AI. So yes, you do stay long. However, on some of the others, maybe they're trading stocks. I mean, Caterpillar's had such a monstrous run, one that I've missed, by the way, that at what point does that extend the valuation to levels that it shouldn't? To so, Josh's point, you've seen NVIDIA get cheaper, despite well, the way the stock's apples in a, apples in a, Apple's in a notable drawdown right now. One of the biggest technology stocks in the world, no, uh, notably, not part of whatever bubble people think they say. Adobe, this is a very AI-related stock. Looks like garbage right now, technically. Great company. Um, there are a lot of tech stories that should be working if it is a bubble that aren't. And the reason why is because people are still paying attention to fundamentals. There will come a time where we stop and we just start chasing tickers. We've seen that. 2021, we saw that. It's just not representative of the way people are investing right now. Let's take a look at shares of Disney because there is that big boardroom battle that we are keeping a close eye. There is a report out that Disney has secured enough votes to win the shareholder meeting. We shall see because it, uh, we're not going to know for quite some time now. Jim Labenthal, he is a Disney shareholder. He joins us now quickly for his thoughts. If that is the case, Jim, what are you going to do? You've, you've told us that you're not selling if Peltz doesn't win, even though you'd like to see him on the board. But now you've had 24 hours to collect your thoughts on that. Is that still the case? Uh, it definitely is still the case. Um, obviously, Scott, this is a great drama here. You know, Wall Street Titan uh, meets a West, West Coast Hollywood Titan. But when we wake up tomorrow, that drama is going to be over. And what's left is a company that looks like it's executing well. Now, let me be clear. There's a lot of wood for Mr. Iger to chop. A lot. He's got to get the Hulu transaction done. He has to figure out how to monetize ESPN. 
I keep saying I think he's got one ace in his sleeve. Now, I don't know this for certain, but I do think that streaming is is that ace up his sleeve. Uh, he's said for the last two quarters it's going to turn profitable by the end of the fiscal year, which ends September 30th. And if you look at the contribution to the following fiscal year, it's looking like it's going to contribute something like 7% of operating income at current analyst estimates. That's a very small number. And my point is that an excellent manager like Mr. Iger knows how to squeeze costs and get that contribution, get that profitability from streaming. That's a variable that he can control, I think, and outperform on the estimates. If he does that, if he does that, then this is a stock that's going to be worth the 22 times forward estimates that it's at right now. So bottom line is, let's get past this drama and keep executing the way Disney has been for the last several months. Jim, we're going to keep it brief. I appreciate your opinion. We'll see you in person soon. That's Jim Labenthal on Disney. By the way, don't miss David Faber's exclusive sit down with Disney CEO Bob Iger tomorrow, 9 a.m. Eastern on Squawk on the Street. Won't want to miss that big interview. Speaking of well-known investors and activists and just big names in general, several are here at Sone presenting today their best ideas for a great cause. Our Leslie Picker joins us now. And what we've already heard and what's coming up this afternoon. We're always here together. It's always a big uh, fun day for it us is. to cover what's happening here. What have we learned so far? Absolutely. So we just concluded the next wave Sone speakers. And it's funny because I was listening to the presentations. I was trying to draw some kind of thread throughout these, but they span sectors. They span geographies. They span market cap size. So the first presentation we heard was a pitch for a long in Payson, which is a data management system for rigs. Then you had Kush Tard, which is convenience store, basically a play saying that uh, just because more consumers adopt EVs doesn't mean convenience stores will go to the wayside. You had a biotech pick as well as a Norwegian digital media company. So again, various geographies, various uh, areas, uh, areas in terms of sector. Uh, but of course, you were just having this conversation about, you know, dispersion, stock picks, uh, this environment. So it'll be interesting to see. We're back at the Sun Conference in New York City, hanging on to some gains in the market. There's Intel shares not up today. That's one of the stocks we're going to talk about. The company revealing why it's a $7 billion operating loss in the foundry business. You own this stock. I do. I do. Look, I mean, the story on the foundry is not about today. The story in the foundry is the back half of the year, and that's why it's holding up reasonably well. So with ASML... You think it should be, could be down worse than 7.5%? Uh, generally, when you report that kind of loss on a company that just has reported a lot of losses, missed a lot of numbers, yeah. like repeatedly, yeah, I would think people throw their hands up, and the stock could have easily been at 35 today as this. You, you, but, this caught your eye, too. You don't own it, but the price action has... Yeah, I expect to see this way worse. We've seen Intel really do nothing but disappoint on this, this fab business, really, I don't know, six or seven years now. But here's the thing. It is absolutely essential that somebody in North America start standing up fabs and, and find a way to profitability. It's never going to be a great business. It's never going to be like designing chips or selling advanced lithography. Nobody expects that. But if Intel is talking about 2027, and the market is saying, all right, let's take 7% off, but that's it. $38 looks like support, at least in recent times. That was a breakout. That should now serve as support. So I'm going to watch to see if on this disappointment, the stock can hold 38. And if it can for a few days, I'm going to take a second look as a long idea. Uh, because I think Intel is really making something very unique here out of this fab idea. And no other publicly traded company in the United States will be able to say that they can do what's being built right now. All right, interesting take. You keep us up to date there. Taiwan Semi, too, Weiss, yeah. is in the news today because of that strong earthquake in Taiwan, the strongest in some 25 years. You have some talking about you know, supply chain, minor impacts. That seems to be the overall tone from the analyst notes that I've read. You own this, too? I do own it, and this one is, is, is a very large position, and it's done pretty well. I mean, it was always ignored. My biggest concern with Taiwan Semi uh, is not the fundamentals we heard Jensen Wong come out and say, if only I can get enough capacity from Taiwan Semi. It's really the China exposure because, you know, what you see in the headlines, China, yeah, they want to invade Taiwan maybe, et cetera, et cetera. Like Taiwan Semi has some significant facilities in China. So that to me is the risk on any story uh, that's in China. But overall, it's still pretty reasonably priced. And guess what? They can't handle 
the orders that they get. So, so I really like this one. It's going to keep going. All right, you want to talk? They don't like your live nation. Okay. Josh Brown. <laughs> okay. Um, you want to articulate once again for our viewers why you continue to? This is, in my opinion, one of the crown jewel companies in the experience economy. So if you think the experience economy holds up yet another year, there aren't five of these. There aren't even three of these. There are two and only one is publicly traded. And they pretty much have a stranglehold on the thing that, one of the things that we want to spend money the most on, which is going to things live. So in this case, it's not sports, it's music. It's a huge, huge story how uh, the consumer just has not backed off. A lot of people said, okay, 2022 is a reopening. People will get it out of their system. That's not the case. The amount of events is accelerating. The amount of money people are willing to pay because of dynamic pricing is accelerating. And Taylor Swift was a huge deal last summer. We're going to have lots of huge tours this summer. And that's why the stock's above 100. And I think we'll get a new high in relatively short order. Weiss, right, so we talked you. about, you know, Intel Weiss, you having that. It's a bit of a laggard. ASML's up 35%. We talked Taiwan Semi. What about Transdime? We don't talk about that a lot. It's up 24% in the first quarter. It's a phenomenal story. It's essentially 48 separate companies that the, comp that the management has been acquiring and no matter what plane you fly, no matter who the manufacturer is, they've got a part on. And they've also bought companies that have a single part in the plane, and then they're able to raise prices. So it's a great story. It's going to keep going. It's a permanent compounder. Hey, uh, Archer Daniels down 14%. Yeah, and I, I don't own it there. No, no. I bought it on the break. So I'm actually up 20% in All right. it. And they'll settle the accounting Still scandal. bullish? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I'm getting lucky now because the commodity tailwind, without that, it'd still be in the 50s. But they'll sell the accounting issue and then it'll be fine. All right, good stuff. Steve Weiss. GXO, you haven't heard me talk about it. It has done particularly well, but they do well each quarter. And I think a lot of outsourcing, it should work. XPO's done great, though, right? XPO's done phenomenally well. Just talking about that yesterday. Yeah. Carrie. Uh, Thermo Fisher, Timo, it's retraced a big move uh, somewhat, so you've got a good buying opportunity. Healthcare, services, technology, great place to be. Right, guys, Nasdaq, Josh Brown. NASDAQ, NDAQ, held up really well this week, going higher. All right, guys, good stuff. Good to have you here. Hello so. and welcome to Blue Cloud Trading. This is a segment of the show where we will take a look at some of the stocks and ETFs that were discussed on the halftime report earlier. I took some of the best clips from the show, and uh, Josh Brown... Steve Weiss, let's take a look at and see how the markets are doing right now. It's Thursday, Wednesday, April 3rd, and uh, the markets kind of changed direction a little bit towards the end of the day, as you will see here. The Dow was uh, up a little bit, and then it dropped, right, towards uh, right around 3 p.m. or so. We had that little big drop there, and then it came back up to close very close to the closing price from the prior day. So it was only down 0.11%. NASDAQ was up 0.23. Found some support there, as you can see. S&P 500 up 0.11%. And the Russell 2000 was up 0.66. So it actually did the best out of the four indices there. And where yesterday it was down the most. With the heat map, you can see that Meta was up 1.88. Oracle up 1.53. Broadcom was up. Micron Technology was up 4.29. Intel got a, had a big drop. We're going to take a look at that stock in a few moments on the charts. Disney was down 3.13. The energy stocks did really well once again. The healthcare, a lot of the healthcare stocks not so good except for Eli Lilly. And uh, so, yeah, let's take a look. One more thing I wanted to just bring to your attention. Gold uh, did really well today. Gold plows to record high after Powell's remarks. Fed continues to believe policy rate likely at peak for this cycle. Gold prices up over 11% so far this year. Silver hits more than two-year high. So we'll take a look at that chart as well. Okay, let's get started first with the indices. What I've done here is I've also added a, a small little chart up in the top left-hand corner here. This is going to show us the weekly chart. And if we need to look at it on a larger scale, we can always switch it over. But this will be the daily uh, information right here and uh, I just want to have a quick reference point when I'm looking at these so the S&P 500 looking very st strong still it's still in an uptrend as you can see we're using the Ichimoku indicator again for those who are new this is a Japanese indicator that's been around actually 
It was created in the 1930s, okay, and didn't become published until the late 60s. And uh, I mean, it's it's held you know the test of time. It's a it's a really good indicator for quickly assessing the markets, the direction of the markets, where they're going, the strength of the market, support levels and resistance levels. You know, so you don't really even have to start drawing trend lines or anything. You can use this because it's dynamic. But uh, I still use horizontal levels for the most part. Okay, so let's let's take a look. Uh, we, what we want is price to be above these two moving averages, the Tenkinson and the Kijinson. We also want it to be above the cloud. And we want this white line that you see here, the closing prices, reflected 26 periods in the past to be above price. We also want the Kumo cloud here to be bullish as it is here. We don't want the lighter color to be under the purple one. So that's the Synchro Span A, that's the Synchro Span B. And I haven't actually mentioned this before, I don't think, but just very quickly so you understand how this is calculated. The Synchro Span A is calculated by taking the Tenkinson, the highs and lows of the Tenkinson, all right, the highs and lows of the Kijinson, and dividing that by two. That's what calculates this. And it projects it exactly 26 periods into the future which is kind of unique. The Senku Span B is essentially the 50, is the highs and lows of the last 52 periods divided by two. And it's also projected into the future. And so it's kind of like very close to like a 50 day moving average, only it's more dynamic. In my opinion, it's better because it's gonna give you, you know, the highs and the lows and it's going to average it out. So that's more important. And as you can see, it can go flat for a little while, creating a level of support, a stronger level of support when you, when you see that. And you can see the stair is just stepping up, right? We have a very strong uptrend right here. All right, let's go to the next uh, symbol here. This is the QQQs. By the way, we're gonna go through the indices here. We're gonna go through a whole bunch of stocks. Uh, so stay tuned for that. We're going to try to get, get through these very quickly. Uh, the QQQ was up. This ETF is up 0.22% today. It got above the Kijinson, but it's still under the Tenkinson. Still strong, though. Uh, Dow was down 0.08, as you can see here. The DIA ETF, it's still under the Kijinson for a second day in a row. Nothing to be too concerned about yet for that. Russell 2000, we saw that big move back up, trying to get right above that 205.49 level. It did get above it, it closed above it, but um, the, let's see where the Kijinson is 205.77. It actually closed above the Kijinson by one penny. <laughs> but that's not, this candle is not very uh, conclusive. You can see that it developed a wick at the top. And when that happens, it means that the sellers came in towards the end of the day, as you can see right there on the three minute chart. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, yesterday I talked about uranium, and this is the U. It's called URNM ETF. Uh, the ticker symbol right there. Yesterday, it broke above the cloud. Very bullish. Uh, now the cloud itself, the single span A is still under the single span B, but uh, I like what I'm seeing here. This is the daily chart. If we look at the weekly, let's switch it over to the weekly for a moment. Right, super strong week that we're having with uranium as well. So um, it's strengthening. I like what I'm seeing with this ETF. So I thought I'd bring it up. IEO is the US oil and gas exploration. Once we broke above on the daily chart, this level, the 106.36, which goes back to over here, the November 18th, 2022. It's uh, now this is the second week where it's taking off even further. And so you know, it's getting a little bit extended above the Tenkinson, but I don't see any reversal candle or any type of uh, danger signals here. The ADX is still moving up. As you can see, the volume is increasing. We're getting a lot of positive information here. So, so far, so good. Amazon looking very strong today. It was up 0.95%. This is the daily chart. Looks great on the weekly as well over here. Microsoft. Uh, is just kind of, uh, it was down a little bit, 0.23%, but it's still in a strong uptrend. Meta broke above the Tenkinson and Kijinson. You can see the Tenkinson is slightly under the Kijinson, but uh, we are still in a strong uptrend here, okay? 
And on the weekly chart, same thing. It's just that price has been stagnant. It's been sort of um, consolidating right above that $476 level for multiple weeks. Uh, this goes back to seven weeks now that we've been stuck in this range. So when, when, when price does get stuck in a range for a bit, there can be an explosive move either to the upside or the downside. My prediction is it's probably going to be more to the upside because there's still more, um, you know, uh, in my opinion, uh, money sitting on the sidelines that's waiting to, to jump back in. We'll see if that takes place or not. Uh, NVIDIA. This is the second week where it's dropping. We had this pivot candle. And this basically represents the sellers pushing the price down here. And it's now stuck in between 974 and 841. I wouldn't do anything at this point. I would, I would just wait it out and let's see which direction it takes. Uh, it may drop a little bit more even into next week and come find support here at 841 before popping back up. Uh, overall, the direction, this is the weekly chart we're looking at. Overall, I like the stock itself. It has very good fundamentals and I expect it to go up further. Google uh, is for the third day now staying above this 153 level. That's the um, 153.98. That's a level I drew back on February 19th. That's positive and the ADX is strong. So I like that. Apple. Now, today was an interesting day for Apple on the daily chart. Uh, well, you can see here on the weekly, it's inside the cloud. Generally speaking, I, I suggest people not trade stocks when, they, when they're inside the cloud on either the weekly or the daily. That This essentially means that there's indecision right now. And uh, we're also in this range. Well, now we are on the bottom part of the range, right, of this rectangular move here. Um, it's a very critical level, actually. As you can see, because it's not just the weekly. The weekly chart here, you can see these. This is the low, the 165, 61. That's the ultimate, you know, I think, support level that needs to be held up. It's the prior low here. If that breaks, it could be a lot of trouble because we do have a lower high. This pivot candle is lower than this one. So it's, it came down, came back up, could not make it was not even able to touch that 197 90, 98 level and dropped and so now we're finding some support right on that line 168.49 based on that right notice how it's holding right above it so we'll see we'll, we'll just pay very close attention to it and uh hopefully we'll hold up for those of you who, who are holding apple at this time advanced micro devices now this is a stock that was requested by one of our subscribers and uh, thought I'd you know, go into detail in this one a little bit. Um, there's a lot of interesting things about this stock. All right, so number one, I wanted to point out something here. The pivot candle that you see right there. Let me just make this chart a little bigger. Um, the pivot candle that you see right here. Now that occurred back on March 8th, okay? And you can see the year that when price broke above this level, it took off. And the question is like, how do you know, for example, when it's the appropriate time to exit a position? It really depends on, you have to first ask yourself the question, am I an active trader? If that's the case, then you really want to uh, stick to the daily chart. If you, if you want to be active about it and, and you're okay with entering and exiting based on the daily time frame. If you're a long-term investor, I, I'd say stick to, this, to the weekly chart. And because you're going to make, you're not going to have to take as many trades, for example, and you have more time to analyze the situation too. But one thing that I noticed about this specific stock is that this pivot, a pivot candle was not just created on the weekly, but also on the daily for on both time frames on March 9th, on Mar I'm sorry, March 8th. So there it is again, that's March 8th. Now, what does this mean? It essentially means, and you can see it right there again. What that means is the buyers came in, they pushed it all the way up to this level, 227.16, the high of that wick. The sellers weren't having any of that. that. So there was a battle essentially taking place here. The sellers pushed it, pushed it, pushed it, pushed it towards the end of the day, on that day, all the way down, 8.76%. If you 
so that's a big, and it happened on high volume. A lot of participants were taking place or were involved in this battle. Once price gets under a pivot candle like that, okay, it's pretty much over as far as I'm, you really want to consider exiting that position because it got under here the, the very next day on Mar uh, March 11th on Monday. So this was on a Friday. On Monday, March 11th, it got under the low of that very important candle. And since then, it dropped as far down as this level, about 15.13% in approximately 14 days. You can see that if you look down below in, the, in this box over here that populates. So it dropped that much. And now it has been recovering, which is good. It's been finding some support here at the cloud. And today, a good some good news, it was up 1.16% on the daily chart, got above the Tankinson. You'll also see that there was a crossover that took place here. That's also a negative sign. You know, it still has two more levels of support. The Span A is right above, is right below it here. And you have the Span B. We also are above the prior low. This here on the weekly chart, um, this goes back to this level. So we have a pivot candle right over here. Let me circle that one right there. And uh, so this would be the area that I'd be really concerned about, 164.71. If price got under there on the weekly chart and, and closed under the Kijinsen, then the, then you can expect a really big drop, potentially. It could drop as much as another 15.6% before it reaches uh, the, the cloud itself. So, um, oops, just moved it. So that's what I'd be, I, I, I would... Uh, uh, right now, I'd just be sitting on my hands and waiting to see how it how it reacts to the cloud here. All right, let's move on from this one. And let's see here. I want to take a look at some of the stocks that were discussed on the show itself. ADM, Archer Daniels. So April 23rd is the next earnings announcement. Prices within, this, within the cloud, I'd stay out of this one for the time being, okay? I'd also wait until after the earnings announcement to see where it is on the weekly chart. Look where it's at, it's under the cloud. Not something I'd be interested in, generally speaking. It's not gonna make it above the cloud anytime soon. It's finding resistance at the Kijinsen. Next stock, GXO Logistics. This one's inside the cloud. I'd pass on that one. INTC today dropped 8.22%, that's in Intel. Uh, it closed under on the daily, that's the weekly chart. On the daily chart, it closed under this low. So we have a lower high than that high, a lower low here than this low. It's in trouble in high volume. Not something I'd be holding. Uh, and on the weekly chart, it's more than likely to drop down to the Kijinsen, which is about 15% away. Um, Live Nation Entertainment. This is uh, one of Josh's picks. So. It has been doing pretty well, right? It has it is on the weekly charts in an uptrend, but these last few weeks, it's turning over. It was down 0.65% today. Let's look at this on the daily. Uh, it also has a negative EBITDA, so negative operating income before depreciation. So I don't like that. Um, the price of sales is good. It's under one. And it has a positive operating cash flow of $1.4 billion, so that's good. And it has a profit margin of about 2.48%, but um, not a proper entry place right now because it's under the tank it's in here, okay? NDAQ is another one that he likes. Um, this one, let's look at the weekly first. It's above the cloud. Everything looks good fundamentally. We have, uh, let's look at the daily now. On the daily chart, we're under the Tenkinson. I'd want to wait until it gets above the Tenkinson if you really wanted to enter a long position here. Uh, TDG is another stock that was discussed by one of the other people. Uh, I think it was by Steve. And this one looks great on the daily. It's up 2.05. It popped today. Let's look at the weekly. Also pretty good. It's just some negative candles, but we're close to the Tenkinson. Thermo Fisher is has come down to the Tankinson on the weekly chart. I don't like it because there's a lot of resistance here above, so I wouldn't be trading this one at all. TSM, 
Um, this is Taiwan Semiconductor, up 1.27% on the weekly chart. I like the chart. Uh, there is some resistance here, though, right there, right about the 145 level. And, of course, this high as well. So, whoops. So I would not be entering a long position until it gets above 145.01. Um, materials, XLB, very strong on the daily chart. I like it. XHB is home builders, also very strong chart. It's uh, stuck in between Tenkinson and Kijinson. I'd wait for it to get above the Tenkinson. XLK, this one's under both moving averages, but it's, you know, it's been in this long range. We're just waiting for it to pop at some point. Um, consumer discretionary is... Uh, I think I mentioned the other day that this one is kind of sloping down a little bit, right? Just a slight slope. We have a lower high than that high. And this is the area that I'd be really concerned about, this low. If it gets under there, it could basically, and, and drops into the cloud and drops under the cloud, you know, it's just going to get, it could lead to a downtrend. Uh, financials is looking pretty strong. Energy. Still very strong, not getting any reversal candles quite yet. If we get a red spinning top, like something like this or that, I'd be concerned. But right now we're still strong. Volume has been declining a little bit though. Industrials, it did not break above the Tenkinson, so I'd hold off still on this one, but it was up 0.51%. Consumer staples, very weak, down 1.1%. 0%. Uh, let's see the weekly chart. Yeah, there's a lot of resistance above, as you can see here. Once we hit that 7641 level, it retracted or it tra retraced based on that pivot candle. All right, so these really do make a difference. And there's other traders looking at these levels, okay? And that's what's happening essentially. And they're putting in, you know, when, the, when everyone collectively is doing the same thing, all right, this is what happens. And so uh, price dropped and it came down to the Tenkinson, found support right on the line, on the close, just like it did here, like it did here. Found support on the cloud here and here. These are very important levels, guys. Um, what would I do with consumer staples at this point? I wouldn't be long entering any new long positions. Number one, you have a lower low here than this low. All right, and so that's not uh, ideal. Healthcare, XLV, uh, we are staying within this range. It's ranging. Um, if we close under 143.42, I'd be pretty concerned about it. Utilities on the weekly chart is um, still not looking that great. We did break above the Kumo, the Ichimoku cloud, but we would have to get above 66.70 to consider any long positions. Uh, Bitcoin today down 0 0.07. This is the ETF, BITO. Uh, just kind of ranging. Um, as long as it stays above 27.44, it's okay to hold. Uh, US dollar, so it dropped today, 0.46%. Uh, if you watched my video yesterday, I told you guys, hey, it's more than likely, it's getting close now to the Kijinson, the red line on the weekly chart. And ideally, we'd like to see a reversal candle take place. Now, we still have a couple more days. We have Thursday and Friday, right, for this to, to completely materialize in the weekly chart. But if it continues going down tomorrow and the next day, that's a really good sign for the markets, in my opinion, especially if it drops under the Tenkinson. Okay, because then the U.S. dollar dropping means the, the stock market is going to go up, typically. Not always, but generally speaking, it does. Um, the VIX also dropped today. It was down 1.85%. That's also a positive sign. The volatility of the market, okay, uh, dropped to 14.33. Real estate, very quickly, um, was up just 0.05%. I don't like this specific uh, sector because it's been kind of stuck in this. A lot of resistance above here. Not something I'm interested in. Uh, gold, outperforming today. I showed you guys that article. Uh, here's one more day. Broke above that 203.38 level. Going, you know, uh, that's a weekly level. So that, oh yeah, this goes to this candle right here. Uh, let me circle it. 
there we go. So it broke above it here on March 28th, and now on Friday of March 28th, that was the weekly, and it's continuing its way up, but looking very strong still. Silver also broke through 23.94 today. It was up 3.69%, so it actually did quite a bit better than gold today. It's going to find some more resistance, though, over here at around the 24.78. What's the high of that? High is 24.90. Let's draw that in there. Guys, if you like this software that I'm using, there is a link down below. You can get a discount of $25 off the software uh, on your first purchase. So I would certainly recommend it. I like it. I've been using it for a long time and I can, you know, you can do a lot with this. You can actually trade off of the charts. You know, you can essentially use the buy and sell buttons that you see right there. And um, if you connect through their brokerage account, which is tied to interactive brokers. So it's not like, you know, some little mom and pop brokerage company, even though it's TC, it's called TC2000 brokerage. Everything goes through interactive brokers. They've partnered with interactive brokers. So it's a really great way to uh, incorporate your trading and your analysis all in one package here. Let's keep going here. And then this is the last one, Bitcoin USD. Uh, this is the, it gives us the price of 65,792. It's just, you know, in this little box basically. And so where's it gonna go? You know, who knows? Uh, we're, we're just waiting for it to see with the direction. If it breaks under the 60,792 level, I'd be extra, very concerned because that's the low here. And we have a, we already have a lower low here than we do here, right? So that's the high and this low is, I'm sorry, this high is lower than that one. We've got a slope going on there. So, all right, guys, that's going to do it for this video. Hope you enjoyed it. And um, thanks very much for subscribing. For those of you who have, if you haven't subscribed yet, remember it's free. It doesn't cost anything to subscribe to this channel. You will see down below in the, in the bottom right-hand corner, somewhere in your screen, there should be a subscribe button. You just press on that. Very easy to subscribe. And it's the subscribers can get that discount for the uh, software if you decide to end up using trying it out. All right, catch you all in the next video.